they send you here for life, and that's exactly what they take. The part that counts anyway. There's not a day goes by I don't feel regret. Not because I'm in here, because you think I should. I look back on the way I was then, a young stupid kid who committed that terrible crime. I want to talk to him. I want to try to talk some sense to him. Tell him the way things are, but I can't. That kid's long gone, and this old man is all that's left. I gotta live with that. Steve, you broke my ankle six days ago. Every man has his breaking point. Fuck you, Steve. You're staying in there for good. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Came here to gloat, huh, George? You and Booker's drummer sure got me. Just go ahead and leave me alone, George. Go away. I came here to tell you that you're better than this, Steve. You're a better person than this. The Stephen King that I've seen over the past few videos, well, I don't know that man. The Stephen King that I know has a gentle heart. He's always been kind and appreciative to his constant readers. And he's always been able to take criticism with a grain of salt. Bookish Drummer went too far. Too far. Why? Because he has a slightly different opinion than most of your fans? Because he's capable of independent thought and critique? Because he doesn't blindly follow trends? I... I I'm just not used to people not enjoying my books. I mean, sure, The Tommy Knockers, Dreamcatcher... I'll be the first to admit that those are shitty books. I'll be the first to admit it. But he put road work in his top 10 list and left off so many of my classics. It, it just got under my skin a little bit. That's all. So you capture him and break his ankle with a hammer? I guess that may have been a little over the line, but... It's beneath you, Steve. It really is. I know, I know. You've overcome so much trauma and hardship in your personal life and your writing career. Growing up poor without a stable father figure. Struggling to become a better writer while trying to start and raise a family. Finally making it big, but having to deal with and overcome your alcohol and drug addictions. Receiving criticism for your books every time you write a terrible ending, or when you even remotely stray away from the horror genre. Taking too long to finish your Dark Tower series. Getting hit by that van and almost losing your life, and later not even being sure if you could continue writing. You've overcome so much pain. You've done and accomplished so much. You inspire millions of people to quit watching reality TV and cat videos for a brief moment to enjoy the immense pleasure of reading. And you're gonna let some kid with a slightly questionable taste in your books ruin it for you? Wow, George, you, you really moved me. I, I guess I really need to start paying more attention to the things in life that really matter. A great man once wrote, get busy living or get busy dying. Well, I can't do too much living in here. Booker's drummers locked me up for good this time. I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Wow, thanks, George. Why did you do it? I guess I just missed my friend. Well, thanks again. Now I just gotta figure out where to go, where I can hide from Booker's drummer. Run away with me, Steve. What? What are, you, what are you talking about, George? I've got a little place down in Mexico, Steve. We can be together, Steve. You and me. I don't know, George. I, I, I don't know if I have those kind of feelings for you or not. I, I don't know. Well, we're about to find out, Steve. Run away with me, Steve. Run away with me. Okay, George, let's go. Where, where's that little place in Mexico? Where is that? Zewatanejo. What? Zewatanejo. Say that again. Say what you want, ho. What did you call me? Eat my burrito. Okay, George, now you're just making stuff up. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Shut up, George, and let's get out of here before Bookish Drummer finds out what's going on. As much as Stephen King has hated my list so far, I honestly think that he's going to enjoy my top five. Let's see what he has to say. Hey, Steve, I'm getting ready. Steve? What the hell? He got out. 
Okay, where's George? How did George let this happen? George? George? George isn't here either. What the, what the hell's going on here? Pennywise, what did you do? I didn't do shit, Booker's drummer. I didn't do shit. So what happened? George broke Steve out of prison, and now those two lovebirds are off to Zaywatanejo. Broke out of prison? Zaywatanejo? Wait, they're lovers? What the f- Welcome back to my Stephen King ranking video series. Today is a very special episode. It is episode 10. It is the final episode in my Stephen King ranking series. And for today's episode, I will be going over my top five favorite Stephen King books of all time. My top five, guys. And if you happen to have missed last week's episode, episode nine, that's where I went over the books that I would rank 10 through 6. So if you want to watch, you know, my top 10 in order, be episode 9 and then episode 10. And then, of course, I have a playlist on my YouTube channel where I have all of my Stephen King ranking videos and also just any other Stephen King related content. I have playlists for those as well. But anyway, enough of the preamble. I have a lot to say about my all-time favorite Stephen King books, obviously. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. And kicking off the video with my fifth favorite Stephen King book of all time. It's my favorite Dark Tower book ever, and that would be Drawing of the Three, book two. I like to tell people that are just starting the Dark Tower series that this is kind of the make it or break it book. Because a lot of people, what they do is they, they read The Gunslinger, and, you know, for those who love it, you know, obviously they continue. But a lot of people don't really like that book, and they think it's very jarring, including me. The first time I read it, I was like, this is weird, but I still kind of enjoyed it. I gave it three stars, but then once I read this book, I quickly fell in love with the series and gave it five stars. So I think this is a much better litmus test, and if you don't like this book, don't continue. And like I said, the first book can be a little jarring. It's all about Roland, and it all takes place from Roland's perspective, and it's basically his character introduction, and it can be a little weird jumping into his world. But then the second book, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it's basically a fish out of water tale. And it's basically Roland uh, using uh, this door that you can see on the cover. And he has to draw people out from different worlds to join his uh, quartet or his gang of people to help him on his quest to the Dark Tower. And by doing this, you get introduced to some of the main characters of the rest of the series, Eddie Dean, who is my personal favorite of the series, and also Susanna, who is a fan favorite. And because Roland is from a different world and he's jumping into this other world, which is actually our world, it's definitely a fish out of water story. And for that reason, it's actually a pretty funny book because Roland gets into a lot of situations and instances where stuff that's normal to us is very weird to him and then stuff that's normal to him is very weird to Eddie and it's actually pretty comical and of course it is Dark Tower so there's some weird wacky scenes in here that are extremely good and extremely wacky and as far as pacing goes this is basically a perfectly paced novel I have zero issues with it it's easily one of King's best paced books by far I don't necessarily want to say too much more about this book and the series in general because I know a lot of fantasy fans, even though they are avid fantasy readers, they haven't necessarily tackled this series yet. And I want more people to go out and read it and be surprised by it just as much as I was the first time that I read it. And I implore anyone who is just starting their journey to the Dark Tower, if you read The Gunslinger and you're not a huge fan of it, or even if you hate it, please continue on to this book. It's much better. And it's a much better litmus test for if you're going to enjoy the series or not. Please don't stop on the first book. If a lot more people gave this book a shot and they didn't stop at the Gunslinger, this would probably be a, and I know it's popular, but it would be 
extremely more popular. I love the Dark Tower series, and this has always been my favorite entry in the series, and this is my fifth favorite Stephen King book of all time, Drawing of the Three, book two. And for number four on my list, my fourth favorite Stephen King book of all time, it'll probably come as a surprise for most constant readers, but I'll explain my reasoning, and that would be If It Bleeds, his newest novella collection. I wouldn't say that this is a weird pick because it's uh, a bad book. A lot of King fans loved this novella collection. It's probably weird because it's relatively new. I haven't really given it time to sit with me, as much as I have some of these older books that I've read either multiple times or I've read a long time ago. Right, this came out last year, so why am I putting it in my top 10 and in my top 5 no less? I will be 100% honest with you guys, there is definitely recency bias here. I read, Like I said, I read this last year, it's extremely new, it's extremely fresh to me, and it's a novella collection and I loved every single novella that we get in here. But there's also some more personal reasons why I love this novella collection, and I'll get into that. Number one, just the fact that it's a novella collection already skyrockets it because I'm a huge fan of Stephen King novellas. I personally believe that Stephen King is a much better novella writer, more so than a short story or a novel writer. I just think that when it comes to writing novellas, he's at the top of his game and he's the most consistent. And this novella collection definitely enhances that. Reason number two, I cannot ignore the fact that my favorite novella in here happens to have a drummer character. And if my memory serves me correct, King has never really had a drummer character have any significant screen time. And that really uh, pleased me. Reason number three is a little bit more personal to me. Very sad, but my dad, who I love dearly, passed away earlier last year. He was a big Stephen King fan just like me. He let me, growing up, watch all of his horror movies when I was very young and probably, you know, too young to be watching them. But we watched them together and that was a lot of fun. And then growing up as an adult, I got into, you know, actually reading Stephen King, which is why I'm freaking doing all, all of these ranking videos. And he, he loved that. I loved Stephen King books. And he would get just as excited as me about, you know, whenever a new Stephen King book would come out. And this book came out, like I said, earlier last year. Uh, but like I said, he passed away earlier last year. And it was very devastating. And a couple of weeks, you know, after he passed, this book came out. And I basically used this just to... You know, I used it for escape, to just escape from my reality, my depression, and I read this book, and it was, you know, obviously I was very excited for it to begin with, but as I was reading it, I was loving every minute of, a minute of it, and I just knew how much my dad would have loved it too. Didn't mean to get too depressing there. Let's go ahead and start talking about, you know, the actual stories in here and why they're terrific and why I love them. So the first story we get in here is Mr. Harrigan's phone. And it's probably my second favorite in this collection, even though it's not necessarily doing anything new. It's not completely original, but the characters in here are really good and it's just very evenly paced throughout and it's just you know, classic Stephen King novella that is just terrific. And it's also told brilliantly in first person, which I really want King to start doing more of. He has, his latest book later is in first person, and most of his books are in third person because there's a lot of perspectives, but I really think he should start utilizing first person more. You know, while he's, <laughs> I was gonna say while he still can, that's, that's fucked up. <laughs> the second novella in here is called The Life of Chuck, and this is definitely my favorite in the bunch. Not because, not just because there's that drama character I was talking about. That is a big reason why, but it's also just very uniquely told. 
and it's got a very different structure than most of King's stories. And it basically starts at the end and then works its way backwards. And I don't want to necessarily say what, it, what it's about because figuring out how it's told in that way is very interesting. One of the reasons why I admire King in the first place is that he's willing to take chances. And he definitely took a chance writing that story and I thought it paid off brilliantly. And it's easily one of the best novellas he's ever written. The third novella in here is the title story, If It Bleeds. And this was the one that I was the most concerned about. The main character is someone that's in some of his other books. I won't spoil that in case anyone doesn't want to be spoiled as to who that is. But it has a character that's in some of his other books. I'm not a huge fan of that particular character. So when I realized that, oh, that person is going to be in this story and it's going to take up you know, the bulk of this collection. I was a bit hesitant, but actually I very much enjoyed it. And even though it is my least, it's still my least favorite in here, I would still give all of these stories five stars. So it's a five star story. And it actually weirdly enhanced my enjoyment of that character. It made me like that character more, which I did not expect going into that. And for that reason, it's very good. And the last story in here is just called Rat. And for King fans who love the horror side of King, it's basically just King tackling a good old horror story and going back to his roots and writing a very compelling, creepy story. And I think a lot of King fans, if they pick this one up, especially if they love the horror side of King, they're probably going to think that one's the best. But anyway, I love this collection. I loved it. The minute I started reading it, I loved it. After I finished it, and after I finished it, I already knew it was going to be a top 10 book. I was like, okay, what am I going to have to take out of my top 10? And when I was coming up with the list, I was a bit surprised that it made it into my top five. But also just, you know, for the reasons that I've given, I'm also not surprised. And for right now, it is my fourth favorite Stephen King book of all time, If It Bleeds. And number three on my list, my third favorite Stephen King book of all time is my all-time favorite novella collection, my all-time favorite collection from Stephen King, and that would of course be Different Seasons. This is the most famous of Stephen King's novella collections, and there's a reason for that. Three out of the four novellas in here have been made into movies, and two of them were very much critically acclaimed. One of them not so much, but it was still, you know, like a decent horror movie. And of course, the first novella in here is Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. Obviously the inspiration for the movie, Shawshank Redemption, which not only is one of my all-time favorite Stephen King movies, but just one of my favorite movies in general. And surprisingly enough, it's probably my least favorite novella in here. And, you know, the movie definitely plays a part in that because the movie is brilliant and I think it's actually slightly better than the story, and it improves a little bit on the story. And that's not to, that's not to knock down, you know, the novella at all, because it's a terrific novella, and I love reading it. But if I want to watch, or if I want to experience the story in its most uh, appealing form, its most beautiful form, I'll probably watch the movie because the movie is flawless. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with the story, it's about this guy named Andy Dufresne who's wrongly convicted of killing his wife and he's sent to Shawshank prison for life. And it's basically his life in Shawshank. It's a perfect example of King writing non-horror and being, you know, being very good at it. There's some Stephen King fans who don't really want to read anything or aren't interested and reading King books that aren't strictly horror. And that's a shame because Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption is easily one of his best stories he's ever told. The second story in here is called Apt Pupil. And this one surprised me because it's my second favorite in this collection. And I had seen the movie a couple times when I was younger and it was fine. 
not like mind blowing or anything, but it was, you know, it was fine. But the novella is terrific and it's leagues better than the adaptation. This one is definitely the lesser known of the three. So I'll say what it's about. It's about this young boy who basically finds out that this old man is a runaway Nazi and he's, you know, been in hiding for a long time. And instead of turning him in, he kind of blackmails him. And the kid, strangely enough, wants to know more about his life as a Nazi and all of the terrible things he did. So it's a very weird dichotomy of like, clearly this Nazi is a bad guy, but also this kid is kind of fucked up because <laughs> I mean, who would do that? So it's definitely a dark story and it's one of those very compulsive reads where you start it and you definitely don't want to finish it. And the fact that it is, you know, a novella length does help because you can easily finish it in a day. The third novella in here is called The Body, AKA Stand By Me. And as far as which one I like the most, the novella or the movie, it's basically the same because the movie is very faithful to the novella and they're kind of one and the same for me. Probably my third favorite in this collection. I like it a little less than Apt Pupil and I actually like it a little bit more than Shawshank. It's also King writing a very compelling non-horror story and it's basically a coming of age story about these four little boys in the 1950s who hear about a missing body and they go try to see if they can find it. It's also another great example of King writing very compelling and very interesting kid characters. Not a lot of writers can make kid characters believable or likable, but he manages to do both. And then the last novella in here that we get is called The Breathing Method. And that's definitely the dark horse of this collection. Not a lot of people have heard of it. Not a lot of people have read it. It's also the only one in here that doesn't have an adaptation yet. And I feel like that's why it's more unknown even to Stephen King fans. And it's definitely one of my favorite Stephen King novellas. Thinking back now, it's either this one or The Life of Chuck from If It Bleeds. One of those two are my all-time favorite novellas. It's probably still this one just because I had such a visceral reaction to the ending. And I don't even necessarily want to get into what it's about because I think it's one of those stories that, you know, it's better not going into it, not knowing a whole lot of about it. And the ending is definitely one of the most memorable endings I've ever come across. I still have the image imprinted into my mind this day, and I will never be able to unsee it. So yes, this has always been one of my all-time favorite Stephen King books, and it's one of the main reasons why I think he's such a terrific novella writer and I think he's better at writing novellas than any other form of writing. And if you're a Stephen King fan and you haven't given this one a shot, I would highly urge you to do so. And it's my third favorite Stephen King book of all time, Different Seasons. All right, we're down to my top two now. Which one will it be? And if you've been paying attention and you're a, a, a longtime constant reader, you'll know which two books are left. So you're probably wondering which one I like the most. And we'll get to that right after this quick commercial break. Hi, my name is Pennywise, the Dancing Clown. Has this ever happened to you? You started a booktube channel and you started talking about one of your favorite authors of all time. And you start to rank all of his books, but he quickly becomes dissatisfied with your list and he captures you and brings you back to his lair and forces you to rewrite his list. But when things don't go well, violence ensues. Steve, you can't be serious. Don't do this. It's for your own good, bookish drummer. Steve, for God's sake, no. <laughs> You're entitled to compensation. Just call this toll free number and justice will be served and you will receive your compensation. And don't forget to pick up a copy of my brand new book, It's Two. I'm making a comeback, baby, for a small price of $99.99. And we're back. And for number two, my second favorite Stephen King book of all time that falls just short of being my favorite. Just short. Anyway, my second favorite Stephen King book of all time is Misery. For me, there's no such thing as a perfect book, right? 
there's always going to be something, even if it's just a word choice or a particular line of dialogue or something. There's going to be something in there that irks you just a little bit. So there's no such thing as a extremely perfect book, right? But when it comes to Stephen King, he has a handful of books that I would consider damn near perfect. And this is no exception. Misery, the scariest book I have ever read. For my money, it's the quintessential horror novel. It's my favorite horror novel. For me, I don't really get that scared reading books. I really don't just, I really just don't get scared in general. But with this book, the very first time I read it, you know, I read it at night and it definitely got to me. It was extremely scary and terrifying. And of course, if you know the story at all, there's a certain scene that happens that, that will just get under your skin. For anyone who doesn't know the story, it's about this guy named Paul Sheldon, who's a writer. And he's been writing these series of novels, these misery novels. And he, he's, he's kind of tired of them. And he's finally written the final misery novel. And after he writes it, he's going to be free of the character. So he's got his manuscripts that he's been writing. And he's on his way to go back to, I think, New York. And in while he's at where he's at, he is driving through this blizzard and gets into a terrible accident. But someone ends up saving him and they bring him back to their house to kind of nurture him and take care of him while this blizzard is happening. And it turns out that this person happens to be batshit crazy. <laughs> Her name is Annie Wilkes and she happens to be Paul Sheldon's number one fan, at least according to her. She loves the misery novels. And she also happens to be a retired nurse. And that's why he's, she's able to basically, you know, take care of him and, you know, give him medicine while his, you know, his legs are just completely deformed. And of course, Paul realizes very quickly that this lady is crazy and that he needs to get the hell out of there. But he can't because his legs are broken. He can't walk. And he's in the middle of, you know, nowhere Colorado after a blizzard, so he's not going to be able to go anywhere. He's in a pretty uh, sticky situation here, people. And then, of course, things start to spiral out of control once she kind of realizes that Paul, you know, has this manuscript of, you know, the next Misery novel. And for Annie, she's very excited because she loves Misery. But of course, when Paul wrote the book, he intended it to be the last Misery novel. So things, you know, don't go exactly well for Paul. I'll say that. And for anyone who hasn't read it, I highly urge you to read it because it's super scary. And Annie Wilkes is honestly one of my favorite villains, if not my favorite villain. And as far as Stephen King pacing goes, even though this is my second favorite book by him, it's easily his best paced book. Like there's not, there's not really anything I would change about this book. Damn near perfect. And of course, it has a brilliant adaptation with Kathy Bates playing Annie Wilkes. And I love the movie as well. And for anyone who's an audiophile, the audiobook to this book is great as well. The woman that they get to narrate the book plays Annie brilliantly. She's very eerie when she's like, you know, quietly speaking. But then when she's yelling, she actually yells, you know, for the audiobook. And it like, freaked me out the first time I listened to it. I was like, holy shit. And I think it's amazing, amazing that King is able to write such a compelling story with basically one location in this bedroom in Annie Wilkes' house. And there's basically only two characters, Paul Sheldon and Annie Wilkes. And it's completely engrossing, completely scary, completely compelling. And it's my second favorite Stephen King book of all time. Alright guys, we've made it. My number one favorite Stephen King book of all time. And that would be The Dead Zone. So why is this my number one favorite Stephen King book of all time? You might be asking, you might be wondering, and I'm gonna tell you. 
When I was first starting to get into Stephen King as an adult, I started reading books that I was more familiar with. So I read The Shining, I read Cujo, I read Misery, I read Different Seasons. I was reading a lot of books, you know, that had adaptations that I watched so much as a kid and that I was very excited to read the book for. But with this book, I picked it up not having ever seen the adaptation. I had never seen the Christopher Walken movie before. And so when I, you know, read the book, it was completely fresh to me. I really had no idea where it was going to go. I had no idea what was going to happen. And of course, with those other Stephen King books that I read before this one, I of course loved them, loved most of them. But for the most part, I pretty much knew what was going to happen. So there was really no shock factor. But with this book, I really didn't know what I was getting into. But right from the start, Stephen King, of course, hooked me in with the prologue and then the, the couple chapters after that instantly hooked me in. And when I started it, I could not put it down. I basically finished this book in one sitting, which is pretty impressive because it's like a it's like a 400 page book. And I don't know if a lot of people have a similar problem that I do. Not necessarily like a big problem, but some of the times when I read a book, I can have a little bit of trouble actually picturing what's going on in the book in my mind. Most of the time I'm able to, but some of the times when I read a book, I'm not quite able to, you know, picture everything fully. But with Stephen King, he always manages to create like a distinct image in my mind. And I remember like reading this book, I, I, I kind of felt that for like the first time. Like I, I read this book and I would read a chapter and just, I could instantly picture like the characters and where they were at and what was going on. This book very much felt real to me. And I still remember having that feeling of like, wow, I actually like, you know, I can picture everything in this book and it feels completely real to me. And I'll be honest, uh, over the past few weeks, I've been rereading this book in anticipation of this still being my number one pick for the for my ranking series. And I was kind of scared because this is all, I've always said that this is my favorite Stephen King book, but I had read it years ago and I had only read it once. And so I was a little hesitant to pick it back up because I, you know, you know, you have that feeling of like, oh, maybe I'm not going to enjoy it as much the second time. And I don't want to lose that feeling of this being terrific. But I didn't have that problem. In fact, I like it just as much the second time, you know, as I did the first time. And I'm, I'm kind of getting all of that feeling that I had back where just everything in here just creates a crystal clear image in my mind. And this book just feels utterly real to me. And I love when books are able to, you know, invoke that, invoke those images in my mind and give me that feeling. So I'm glad to say that this is still my favorite Stephen King book of all time. And I was basically able to still say that like only having read like the first, you know, like 100, 150 pages after like, even after like the first 50 pages, I was like, yep, still my favorite. I guess I should also probably say what this book is about. I'm really bad about that. Like, I'll just start talking about a book and then I won't say what it's about. Y you have a booktube channel, Jake. You got to say what the book's about. What are you doing? It's about this guy named Johnny Smith and he gets into a terrible car accident that puts him into a coma for about, I think, four or five years. And when he, once he wakes from that coma, he finds that he has this terrible power to see into the future. And he's able to predict the future by touching someone. And the first, you know, instance of that is when he touches someone in a hospital and he sees an image of a burning house. And he, you know, quickly tells that person, like, your house is on fire. Like, you need to go do this. And then, you know, he kind of becomes... A national sensation like he's actually able to predict the future and that's as far as I'll go in terms of plot because this book is kind of all over the place with plot and that's probably the main reason why people would not put this as high as I do especially not only just in their top 10 list but especially in their number one spot 
people do like this book, but probably the main reason why people don't like it as much as me is that it can feel a bit disjointed. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of different plot things going on in this book. It's not King focusing on one thing and just, you know, kind of telling a smooth story. It's not like that. He kind of tackles different stories and while doing that he utilizes different genres and, and I really thought that was cool because kind of, you know, there's a sci-fi element because he's able to kind of predict the future, right? He can touch someone and like see into their future. Pretty cool. But there's also kind of a murder mystery slash horror aspect and I won't get into that because that'd be spoilery. There's also kind of a romance side because at the beginning of the story he's you know seeing this girl and they've been going out for a while but obviously when he goes into a coma for four or five years the woman you know has to move on but then once she realizes that you know the love of her life is out of the coma uh-oh. <laughs> but then on top of all that, you've got this political side of the story too towards the end. And so it's kind of a mishmash of different genres and a lot of people think it's kind of disjointed. And I wouldn't necessarily argue with that. I just really thought it was a cool way to tell the story with a really cool and interesting character in Johnny Smith. He's definitely one of my all-time favorite Stephen King characters. So while it's not an example of King having terrific pacing, it's a terrific example of King writing a compelling story with compelling characters, and the ending is one of my all-time favorite Stephen King endings. And even though this is my favorite Stephen King book of all time, it's a little hard to recommend it to people because... It's such, like I said, it's such, it's such a mishmash of genres. Like you've got a little bit of horror, you got a little bit of sci-fi, you got a little bit of romance, you got a little bit of uh, political intrigue, you got a little bit of mystery. Th there's so much going on in this book that it's hard to really pinpoint if someone's gonna enjoy this book. So it's not exactly a great starting point with King, but I will say if you are a constant reader who's read a good amount of King books and you haven't read this book, I highly urge you to do so because, like I said, my all-time favorite Stephen King book. I absolutely love it. Even though that The Dead Zone is my favorite Stephen King book of all time, I would say that it barely beats out Misery. Like, just barely. It's, it's really hard for me to choose between the two, but I will say that this is just a, it's a more unique experience. And for that reason, it's, it's always been my favorite. All right, guys. That has been my Stephen King ranking video series where I have ranked all of Stephen King's books and collections and I've had a blast making this. And I have to give a quick shout out to all of my subscribers and all of the people who have stuck with the series and have watched it and have been commenting in the comments section about, you know, my picks and what they think of them and what their favorite and what their least favorite Stephen King books are. I've had so much fun commenting with you guys and it's it's just been a just a real treat. But sadly, all good things have to come to an end and this is the final episode in my Stephen King ranking video series. And I believe for my next big Stephen King project, I threw out two ideas in one of my videos. One of them was a top 100 characters list, and the other one was ranking all of Stephen King's adaptations. By far, most people want to see me rank Stephen King adaptations, so I am going to tackle that. It won't necessarily be anytime soon, because... Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of Stephen King adaptations that I have yet to see. I've seen almost all of them. I've seen a lot, but there's quite uh, there's quite a few newer ones that I haven't seen. And then there's a few really obscure older ones that I've never even heard of. So I, before I tackle that, I need to actually go out and watch them and then do a little bit more research and actually compile my list. So that probably won't be until about another month or so. But while I'm, you know, doing all of that, I will still be releasing 
Stephen King videos. And a couple of videos that I'm going to do are best places to start with Stephen King, worst places to start with Stephen King. And then I'm going to make a couple of videos of like which adaptations I still need to watch. Probably I'll split that into multiple parts going over like the older ones that I need to watch and then the newer ones I need to watch. And then after that, that should be about like a month maybe. So after that, I think I'm going to um, uh, start it. And I hopefully you all join me in that as well. Anyway, what did you guys think of my top five list, my top 10 list, and just my whole uh, ranking series in general? Please let me know down in the comments. And also, what are your all-time favorite Stephen King books? What are your all-time least favorite Stephen King books? If you are inclined to do so, this might be a bit of a task, but if you want to rank all of the Stephen King books that you've read in the past, uh, please feel free to do so, and I will definitely be checking those out if there's any of those. So please feel free to leave any of that down in the comments below. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. I hope Steve and George are having fun in Zewatanejo. Wow, George, it's beautiful. I know, isn't it? We're going to have a happy life here, Steve. Real happy life. So what do you want to do tonight, George? Maybe watch a movie? Yeah, sure. Why don't we watch The Shining? Isn't that one of your favorite adaptations? George, I'm just kidding, Steve. I know you don't like that movie. I think that's actually Bookish Drummer's favorite movie. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Steve? Steve? What are you talking about, George? I was just saying that, you know, The Shining, it's, it's Bookish Drummer's favorite horror movie. And I'm pretty sure it's his favorite Stephen King adaptation. He said something about maybe ranking all of your adaptations. So I figured that would probably be his number one Stephen King movie. You're joking, right? T tell me you're joking, George. No, no, I think that's actually his favorite horror movie. I mean, I mean, I like it. I think it's a good movie. Steve, are, are you okay? You, you, you're shaking pretty bad there. Steve? Steve? Bookish drummer!